just on Friday, this Friday, I, I had a guest lecture. I, I was teaching master's students in, in sports science and their second year students, and they're kind of starting to think about jobs and, and getting finished. And I brought in a coach from the Uno X pro cycling team, Espen mm -hmm. Ershold, who I work with a lot. And he's a great guy. And his training background, his father was a national team coach, but his personal background is, is psychology and, and therapy. And, and I really see it in, in the way he talks with athletes. He, he connects with them. And, and then he put up a pyramid of kind of different factors and focus areas that the team was interested in developing because they're a developmental team. And there were 10 of them. And really only about one or two of them were physical. Mm. And I thought that was, and, and he pointed that out, but I thought it was very in, uh, uh, illust illustrative of the realities of things is, yeah, you, you got to have the talent, of course, but but everybody at that level has got some pretty serious physical ability. Mm -hmm. So that's not the decider often. It's more about uh, their ability to work with other people. You know, like the, the <laughs> I hate to say this, but like one of, the, one, one of the edicts of the All Blacks, the rugby team from New Zealand is don't be a dickhead. You know, in other words, is being a good person. Because if you're a good person, if you are easy to communicate with, people will help you along the way. But if you're not, then they won't. And, and that's pretty decisive. <laughs> you know, it can be pretty important in the pathway of an athlete is just, you know, remember that, that in your little bubble of self-absorption, which we athletes tend to have to go into, uh, come out of it sometimes, folks, so that you can, you know, be uh, reasonable to talk to that you, you know, <laughs> you respect other people and, and just things like that is good communication, respect, you know, for, for, for the people around you learning how to deal with trauma and trials and tribulations, because you will crash. You will, there's not an athlete around that doesn't have a story of redemption, you know, that where they have, it, you know, it fell apart. And usually that's part of the growth process. So yeah, the physical part is obviously important. I'm, you know, you got to have the tools, but out of every thousand that have the tools, you know, maybe 10% take the next step. So, so it's not just, that's not enough. Mm -hmm. That reminds me of a, of a great book. It's more in the let's say business development side uh, called never eat alone where he talks about the importance of the network that you create around you, because no matter where you want to go in life, you're never going to get there by yourself. And I guess that's even maybe true. It's, it's, it gets true and true the higher you get as a, a the higher level you reach as an athlete, uh, because you need a, 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 a bigger and bigger support team. And I, I guess we saw with Niels van der Poel that you can do with very little if you're, like you said, very thoughtful about what you put in place. But um, that, that's very interesting that you bring up, uh, you know, just being a good person, it, it goes such a long way. And uh, you're gonna just enjoy the process so much and the people around you are also gonna uh, enjoy helping you, you know, reach reach your own goals, because they're gonna get something out of it. Yeah, and, and, and I, the, the thing that just struck me when I spoke with Niels was he was a nice person, you know, extremely dedicated, hardcore, serious athlete able to push some damn impressive watts, but at the end of the day, smiled and, you know, said, how are you doing? You know, he, he, and, and I think that's just, it doesn't get better than that. And so coaches enjoy working with people like that. And, and, and I've been lucky enough to meet a lot of athletes like that. So don't get me wrong. I, it's, there are, I, that's what I see in, in some of the best athletes in the world is they're, they're just good folks and they, they care about life and they care about others as well. And, and I would even say that sometimes what I've seen is that when athletes go from being solitary gladiators, you know, they're single and they're, you know, to a life phase where they enter into a relationship, they get, they have children and that, that almost makes them better athletes because they appreciate it all more. Uh, it doesn't make them worse. You know, it makes them better very often. Uh, even though time commitments are tough, but they, they're disciplined and they appreciate uh, the whole process even more. I guess it, it gives you something else to um, 
anchor to maybe if your training isn't going well if physically you have an injury or something like that if you only have training you're more likely to you know get depressed from being injured and maybe kind of losing your way quote unquote but if you have that anchor that family anchor or maybe other activities on the side that are not directly related to training just as a, as a person you you're just more stable across time and that's going to also be a factor in uh, succeeding no matter what you're trying to do yeah i think you hit it on the on the head there i i, I really do think that it it's very challenging for athletes because on the one hand the ability to be laser focused and in a way um kind of have some some tendencies that aren't necessarily very healthy in the sense that you become very isolated uh that can be part of your success formula but it's not sustainable mm -hmm. you, you you need you know what i mean you, mm -hmm. you um and you have to have an identity a self-identity that's more than just i'm a runner uh because boy as soon as you get an injury and you're not running what then are you now are you nothing of course not you know so, so that's that's the vulnerability that happens when when athletes are so invested in their identity as performers because that's a fleeting thing no matter what uh it won't last you know <laughs> uh even the best of the best have a, a fairly short window of um success at the highest level so anyway i i, I think you're right i think it, it has to do with just finding that balance in life and 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 you know running is something i do but it's not only thing i am or cycling or whatever it may be you know I, i've seen it in my own children i've seen it in, in athletes and and i've seen it in myself you know we've all gone through these phases where we feel like we lose our identity i guess we need to after you know bringing intensity distribution to the forefront of the conversation we need to talk about attention distribution and also being balanced in the way that we that we look at our training and there's times to go all in on training but then there's times to maybe step away um in more or less extreme ways like neil's taking two days off every week or having long you know months sometimes years without uh heavy training uh but having having both sides uh contribute to the to the equation at the end oh yeah and, and the five two that you refer to there if I, you know if it's a big change of topic but boy that took some serious courage uh, <laughs> for an athlete to do because it's so uh, anathema to the thinking of of athletes in general is to take even rest days at all and then to take two of them but i in a way i would almost say there was genius in that uh because of the it, it was actually a kind of an extreme polarization of the of the stress load uh that i'm not sure could work for everybody but but he had the mentality he created the environment for himself to be able to do it you know in the sense of you know he did kind of isolate himself and create this environment so I, that five days a week he could you know do these really heavy loads and and they discovered that when they did the double you know two days of recovery you know one day we've all taken one day of recovery and it helps but that second day they said we could almost throw anything at him and he recovered you know so that was an in, really interesting revelation and but it wasn't them that discovered it that that the other thing it, they had evidence from before of other athletes in sweden that had successfully used this methodology and he had done it initially not because he thought it would make him a better athlete it's because he wanted to do skydiving and the skydiving stuff happened on the weekend so the only reason he started with a 5-2 model was that he wanted two days a week so that he could skydive with his buddies uh and then when skydiving season was over at one point he said well you want me to do you know want to go back to a regular uh duty cycle you know and, and the coach said i don't think so because this is working really well for you you know <laughs> and so so that was actually if you hear the interview that i thought that was really interesting is he he made a decision based on his mind of finding balance socially you know five hard days and then i get two days to do what i want to with my buddies uh that was the initial decision that that he felt would be he said if i'm going to work this hard i've got to have a negotiation that is the deal if i can do it that way i'll do it 
So it was social, it was health, mental health. But then it turned out that it also gave him a physiological ebb and flow that worked. Mm -hmm. So I thought that was pretty fascinating. You know, now, again, I'm not trying to say everybody needs to suddenly go five, two, but, but I am thinking, Hey, don't be afraid of rest. You know, don't be afraid of rest days. They are restorative. I think probably these full on rest days have a remarkable importance for resetting the autonomic nervous system. For example, I think that may be one of the big issues because the autonomic nervous system is what often will get kind of thrown out of balance by the repetitive loads. And uh, he, and he was with that. He also knew that on day five of his uh, five day training block, he could not do the same work as he did on the, on day one, which maybe could irritate some athletes that expect the same level of output every single day and every single training. But he knew that, and he, he actually structured his training in such a way that, Uh, it was harder on the first days and uh, maybe a little bit not easier because yeah. it's still monstrous workloads and intensities, but it, it was different day four and five. And he, and he knew he could not have the same level as day one, which again, takes a lot of um, introspection and just acceptance yeah. of, of how the, the body um, adapts and is influenced by training. Yeah, I agree. It was an interesting, you know, and he said, he said, because we were in these fairly regimented cycles of activity, For weeks after weeks, he, he had excellent da data in this comparative data to know and, and just a few percentage point change in his power told him something that would be enough to him to say, ah, I need more rest, you know, and so it was, again, uh, it's a one off, it's, it's, but it is reflective of just the process of some of the best athletes. And I think we could go into other athletes and find that they, you know, they didn't write a manifesto, but they, they've been similarly aware, self-aware, uh, and similarly tuned in to their, their own bodies. And I, I do think that's in an age of metrics, you know, because Von der Poel didn't measure a whole lot of stuff. He mostly, he, you know, he measured Watts pretty regularly, but he didn't measure lactate all the time or heart rate all the time or whatever, but he was very well tuned in to, to his body signals. And I think that is still what we see in the best athletes is, is that in inner calibration that you need to have, you know, you need to work on that and don't become blinded by your metrics.